I will share my screen and the content a little later. Uh, but the first initial part of the talk is going to be uh, more uh, more casual, and you can you guys can also chip in. So I'll try to make it uh, kind of interactive initially, and then I will go into the more detail aspects of the talk. Okay, so uh, IoT uh, IoT has been around for let's say twenty years. Right, 20 years back at the start of the uh, millennium, uh, we were talking about something called wireless sensor networks. Basically, a bunch of sensors which are wirelessly connected to each other or to a gateway, and then from that gateway, the data goes to the cloud. So that was the kind of this uh, thing people were looking at. A lot of research papers were published in that time frame we are talking about something like 2003 2004 2005 so a lot of research was going on in the field of uh, wireless sensor networks then uh, 10 years ago uh, let's say uh, 2013 or 2010 uh, people started paying more attention to iot so the term became more popular internet of things where devices get connected to the internet there are different ways they get connected and then they send data. Then the data can be analyzed. And through this analytics, something useful can be done to meet the goals of the particular use case. So uh, IoT was pretty much a hot topic 10 years back. But since then, uh, you know, the interest has kind of died down. Today, we don't hear much about I IoT. Mostly we hear about chat GPT. AI, ML, to some extent, those keywords, cloud computing is still hot. So these are the things people are talking about today. So where is IoT in this picture? So any thoughts from anyone on this? So is IoT still active or is it dead? You can share your brief thoughts, then I'll give my uh, point of view. OK, no issues if uh, there are no inputs. Uh, so the thing is, what has happened in the last five years is uh, interest in IoT uh, kind of dying down because people haven't been talking so much about it. But that doesn't mean that it is dead. IoT is still around, very much around, and uh, we can see this in the numbers. So in 2010, a report was published by Ericsson, who, which is a well-known company in the telecom domain. So Ericsson published a report saying that uh, by 2020, there will be 50 billion IoT devices. So that uh, report was pretty much influential because uh, people did not know the scale of IoT. And uh, the report was well researched, but at the end of the day, it was still a marketing report. And uh, it, it is hard to predict the future. So finally, what happened? We did not get anywhere near uh, 50 billion IoT devices by 2020. The uh, realistic estimates are that we were some something like 11 billion or 12 billion devices by 2020. And today, where are we? Today, we are somewhere at 15 to 16 billion IoT devices connected to the web. So between 2020 and uh, 2023, you can see uh, we are adding something like 1. Point Three or 1.5 billion devices every year, which means what people are still deploying IoT systems, still deploying IoT devices, and uh, all this data is going to the cloud. And if they are doing it right, this data is being used towards analytics. So what they call IoT analytics, and through these analytics, they try to op uh, optimize operations. They may try to uh, cost optimize things. Uh, or manage their resources better, resource optimization. So all kinds of things can be done uh, through analytics. So that is if they are doing it right. But then there are a lot of people who are collecting data from IoT, but not putting them putting all this data to effective use. So the data is just lying there in their store, and then they are not being uh, utilized. So uh, that kind of IoT is not a true IoT. It's collecting data just for, uh, you know, just to get on the bandwagon of IoT, but the data is not being effectively utilized. 
so end of the day what is uh, what is my conclusion is that iot is still around people are still deploying iot uh, systems except that the hype has died down we, we are more realistic now we know that uh, we did not achieve 50 billion devices by 2020 and today we are nowhere close to that number but we know where we are and uh, you know where we are going we are adding something like 1 billion devices every year and this is expected to grow. Now, in this scheme of things, uh, it is uh, good to ask why did IoT fail? Why did those predictions uh, uh, did not materialize? So, if you look at this, one of the most uh, quoted reason is that uh, the lack of interoperability. So, uh, that means different devices are being deployed by different vendors, maybe in the same environment. When I say environment, it might be a smart factory or it might be a smart home. So in that environment, you have, let's say, a dozen devices. Unfortunately, these devices are coming from different vendors. And these devices don't talk to each other. Now, as a consumer, you yourself might have a personal experience here. So you might have bought a fridge from, let's say, LG, a smart TV from Samsung, or you might have a RO from Kent which might be connected to Wi-Fi, let's say. Then you have a smartwatch from Apple. So you have like a dozen devices in your home, but these devices don't talk to each other. Then you have a light bulb from Philips, Philips Hue, they call it. So all these devices need to be controlled, need to be adjusted. Uh, so you have, let's say you want to change the color of the Philips bulb, or you want to dim the intensity of the bulb. What do you do? You open up the Philips app and then you control the light bulb. But if you want to change the control, uh, change the temperature of your AC, the settings of your AC, you have to open a different app. So now this, this is what is known as, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation of the IoT market. There are all these different de devices in a single environment, but they are unable to talk to each other. And not only that, uh, uh, they are coming from different vendors, so it's hard to integrate these things together. So in this scheme of things, what happened uh, or what is happening today? So we st suddenly started seeing uh, controls through uh, voice activated devices. So uh, uh, some of you in your homes, you may be having either the Google Assistant. I think they have a device called Google Home or something. Or you may be having uh, Alexa uh, device, uh, Amazon Alexa and uh, Amazon Echo device or you might be controlling the devices in your home through Apple Siri and the equivalent devices that go with it. So now these voice uh, based interfaces are uh, becoming the way for consumers to control their devices, even though the devices may be uh, different. They may be coming from different vendors. So recently I visited one of my friends and uh, he has uh, of course, there are many devices in his home, but let's just talk about two devices in his home. One of them is an AC. I don't know from which uh, vendor it was. Then the other device was a blind uh, automated. Uh, it's a, like electrified uh, blind. So now uh, during the day when the environment outside is hot, the sun uh, light comes into the living room and then it heats up the home. So then he asked, uh, he wants to, let's say, uh, close the blinds. Then the reverse operation happens during at, at night. At the same time, he, is also, he also wants to control the AC. So what he has done is, uh, actually, I, I visited him and uh, he gave a simple command to his uh, Google assistant. He, say, he said, hey, Google, cool down the living room. Now, when he gave this command, automatically the AC switched on and the blinds closed. Two different devices from different vendors. Both reacted to this command. How did this happen? Even though they are coming from uh, different vendors, it was possible because he has done himself as a developer. He has written some command and that command is interfaced to uh, Google Assistant. So because he was a developer, he was able to do it. But this integration effort is not trivial because you have to know what API to call to control the AC. Similarly, you have to know what kind of API to call to control the blinds. 
So this is an integration effort which every developer has to do. Now imagine a system which has a dozen different devices. You have to do all this kind of uh, integrations in your at, at your application layer. So this is where the difficulty of IoT is. This fragmentation of the IoT market. To some extent, this fragmentation was, I wouldn't say solved, but mitigated through these uh, voice assisted devices. But still the effort lies with the developer. The developer had to put in effort to control all these devices and coordinate their activities to achieve a certain goal. So the example I gave, the goal is to cool down the living room. And to do this, he had to invoke functionality on two devices. So in future, more complex applications will come where you would have to do this for more than one, uh, maybe a dozen devices. So all these have to be coordinated through uh, at the application layer. So this uh, problem of IoT, which is fragmentation of the IoT ecosystem, is what uh, WOT or uh, what we call as, uh, and this is the standard I want to talk about, the web of things. So this is what web of things aims to do. It aims to solve the fragmentation of the IoT ecosystem at the application layer so that one device can talk to another device. There is a standard way for devices to expose their capabilities, expose the, their data models. So by unifying the data model at the application layer, it will become possible for any device to talk to any other device. So that is what uh, Web of Things aims to achieve. So this is the brief introduction to where we are today uh, with IoT and what Web of Things as a W3C standard uh, aims to do. So here I'll give a pause. Uh, if anyone has a question, you can ask now. So this may be a good time to ask basic questions because now we'll go into the details of Web of Things, which is the real focus of this talk. Any questions? OK, so. So the first question, of course, is why do we need the Web of Things? So I already explained this to you. The main reason for this is the IoT market today is fragmented. Uh, when I say today, I don't mean exactly today, maybe a couple of years ago or two or three years ago. Because today with uh, WOT and similar standards that are coming up, some of this fragmentation is being addressed. So in the past, this is how it was. The IoT uh, you know, ecosystem was very much fragmented. Even today, that fragmentation is there at the networking layer or what we call the, the connectivity layer. So you see different devices connect to the internet in different ways. So there could be devices that connect through NB-IoT, which is a cellular standard. Let's say it is, this is related to 4G, for example, 4G and 5G. So some devices could, could connect through NB-IoT. Then there are other devices which use the IEEE protocol. 802.15.4. Then the old devices that are based on the Zigbee specifications, they will use Zigbee. Then there is the thread protocol, which uh, you know interacts with IPv6, and this is one of the protocols uh, which Google uh, sponsored and Google uh, kind of took it forward. So this protocol is another way to connect to the internet. Then of course others are there which I have not listed, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. So your uh, smartwatch will connect through Bluetooth, whereas your mobile phone uh, will connect through 4G or 5G. Uh, and uh, your laptop will connect through Wi-Fi to your uh, home router. So different devices connect to the internet in different ways. So this fragmentation is still there. So this is fragmentation at the connectivity layer. And this is going to be there uh, moving forward as well. But let uh, keep this aside. How do we solve the fragmentation problem at the application layer? Right. So even though all these devices are interconnected through the internet, through the cloud, through a gateway, they don't understand each other because at the data layer or at the application layer, they are 
using different data models. So that is what uh, you know, Web of Things aims to stop, solve. It tries to unify the data model at the application layer. And uh, to you, it may not make much sense right now, but when we go through this talk, uh, you know, this will make better sense. Uh, to give you an analogy, uh, I can uh, give you an analogy. This is, uh, uh, go, let's go back to the 1990s. Let's assume for a second that uh, HTML did not exist, right? HTML did not exist. So if I am a web developer, what would I do? So let's say I am developing a web page uh, and I create my own language. It's not HTML, it's some other language. I create my own specific language and I publish my data. Uh, let's say I am publishing some blog data. I am publishing that blog data in my own language. Now, of course, uh, consumers of that data open a web browser to access that data, enter the URL. Now the web browser has to understand the data but my data is in a proprietary format. It is not in HTML. So the web browser has to implement this proprietary format to make sense of this data so that it can decode that data and display it uh, correctly to the consumer or the reader. So this is how the web might have been in the 1990s. Now let's take some other web publisher or content publisher. He will invent his own way of publishing data. Now the browser that was developed for my use case will not work for that second publisher because his way of generating or publishing data is different. The format is different. The semantics are different. So now the browser has to be upgraded. It has to now support two different formats from two different content publishers. Now the complexity now becomes uh, unmanageable on the web browser side because it has to start supporting multiple data models on the browser side. Worse still, you cannot interlink one web content to another because each web content is now being published in a different uh, format and semantics of its own. So imagine the web would have never uh, taken off if this had been the situation where everyone publishes the content in different formats. Fortunately, this was not the case. Uh, fortunately, HTML came first before the web became popular. In fact, HTML was what made the web popular. So because of HTML, browsers needed to implement only HTML properly. And anyone who is publishing content will make sure that they publish content in HTML format, which meant that browsers could now display content from any public publisher. So this is what you know HTML brought uh, to the World Wide Web. And that is exactly what is happening with the Web of Things as well. So in fact, this was this sentiment or this point was made nicely by one of the guys at Siemens. So you can I have mentioned it here. So you can see here, Marcus Regal at Siemens, he made a comment that WOT will do for IOT what HTML did for the World Wide Web in the 1990s, right? So he predicted that uh, you know this IOT standardization, which is happening under WOT, will gain momentum, and this will in turn lead to the greater uh, kind of uh, deployment of uh, IoT. Today IoT is kind of the deployments are restricted or the value of IoT is being restricted because of this problem of interoperability. So if people start adopting WOT for their IoT uh, deployments, then you know things will become interoperable and uh, you know IoT will really take off. So that is the expectation. Uh, and the reason I uh, thought of giving this talk today is something happened just a few days back, just last week. So on 5th of December, W3C published, uh, you know, uh, WOT architecture document as well as the thing description document and also the dis discover document. So three documents were published as recommendations. 
so we can say that you know some maturity has been reached at least from the standardization perspective and these are not the first cut of these documents you know the first uh, recommendations were published in 2020 so over the last 3 years you know people have tried this uh, standard uh, in the real implementations real deployments and some maturity has been achieved and an update of the standards has already been published this year. So now we have to wait and see where uh, this particular standard goes. So that is something that we need to watch for in the coming months. So 2024 is going to be an important year for this standard. We'll know how is the adoption, whether more people in the industry are adopting it. So I will pause here. Any questions? So if you look at the history of uh, the Web of Things, it all started in 2007. Uh, the term was first introduced by somebody called Wild uh, in a paper which he titled Putting Things, Things to Rest. So now you may be wondering, what is this Web of Things? You know, uh, we know we are familiar with IoT because that term has been there with us for some time. But this so-called web of things, why is it called web of things? So the case for this is, if you look at the web, what is web? Web is nothing but a collection of documents. Every document is represented by something called as a universal resource identifier. So this URI is then accessed through HTTP protocol. And then the data format in which the in which uh, you know these URIs expose uh, the data or the information is HTML. In some cases, it could be XML, and then later on we started having uh, formats like JSON. So these are the set of concepts which have already been proven and uh, you know time tested on the web: URI, HTTP, HTML, XML. So the question was: uh, for IoT, why do we need to invent new stuff? Why don't we reuse concepts on the web which have already been proven over time? So this is what the web of things aims to do. So it aims to treat everything. When we talk about things, it can be a sensor or an actuator. A sensor is like an example would be a temperature sensor, humidity sensor. An actuator would be a water pump, right? Water pump installed, uh, let's say, on an agricultural farm. That's a water pump or let's say in your home you have a water uh, uh, a motor to pump from your sump to the overhead tank so that's an actuator so what we call as a thing can be you know any kind of a device which is connected to the internet a sensor or an actuator but let's not treat this as uh, standard iot devices why don't we start seeing them as a web resource so once we uh, use this kind of a what do you call mapping we can apply all the concepts of the web uris http html xml json to iot devices and this is what web of things aims to do so that is the reason for this name okay and uh, one of the guys who promoted or did the initial research on the web of things is uh, going on who uh, did his uh, doctor of science dissertation in this field. And his thesis was published in uh, 2011. And he also wrote a book in 2016 on this topic. So he says about uh, WOT, WOT is nothing but a refinement of IoT by integrating smart things, not only into the internet, but also into the web. That is at the application layer, right? So the thing is, uh, take note of this. At the networking layer, integration has been done by different protocols, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, NB-IoT, uh, Thread protocol. So, so many protocols have already solved this problem of integrating devices into the uh, internet. But then they have not solved the problem of how to integrate at the application layer horizontally. So this is the problem that is being solved by the web of things. Okay. 
and subsequently the standardization of the web of things was taken up by w3c and the first uh, set of recommendations came out in 2020 and the most recent update came out in 2023 uh, that is just uh, last week so this is the history of uh, you know wot and you may be asking uh, what is the kind of implementations which are out there uh, we'll go more into that. we'll talk more about that but briefly eclipse uh, provided a, has a project for wot and that project is called thing web so this was uh, you know kind of the work on this started somewhere around 2018 and regular updates uh, has been coming out uh, from this eclipse project so it's not just a standard. There are also implementations to go with the standard. Any questions at this point before I move on? Any questions? No questions. No questions. OK, OK. So we'll, uh, I'll not go into every uh, little detail of WOT, but briefly I will uh, go through the main details so that you get the essence of what it is. So let's first look at the architecture because it gives a big picture of what uh, WOT is all about. So it's a layered architecture. So at the bottom you have the network things, right? Uh, what we call as thing. It could be different types of devices, and all these devices are connected to the internet through different protocols. But above this, WOT defines four layers in which this protocol is uh, architected. Uh, so at the now, uh, uh, actually here uh, I have to mention, uh, most of us are familiar with the OSI layers, right? OSI seven layer model where we talk about physical layer, link layer, back layer, link layer, and so on. A networking layer, transport layer, right? This cannot be directly mapped to any of those things, right? Because they uh, cannot be mapped to the OSI layers. So network layer is here, but everything that you see here, layer one to layer four, are actually application layer with respect to what do you call with respect to the OSI uh, stack? So don't think, uh, get confused by layer one here with the layer one of the OSI model. So layer one, uh, we talk about access. How are, uh, remember we are all talking about the data layer here. This whole thing is the application layer. So when we talk about access, it all means that how do we access the data? We are not talking about how to access the device. We are talking about how capabilities of the device are accessed. What is the what is the format of the data? So that is what we mean by access here. So here the data is very clear. Uh, the uh, specs are clear. HTML, JSON, REST API. These are the ways MQTT, CoAP, these are the ways in which we can access the data of the devices, capabilities of the devices. Or this is how we communicate at the application layer to the devices. So this is the access layer. Then layer two is find. That is, you have billions of devices out there. How do we find these devices? So again, you know, you will see that there are very much parallel uh, ideas with the web. Today in the web, how do you find uh, documents? We use search engines. Similarly, when you want to find devices, IoT devices, uh, you know, uh, on the web, you will again use search engines, but these search engines are now able to recognize IoT devices. They are able to find IoT devices because now the data model enables these search engines to do just that. Uh, and uh, they, they is not just Google search. You can also do semantic because all these devices uh, have a semantic component to it. Yeah, I'll explain this a little bit more later. So you can do deeper search and on the capabilities of each of these devices. 
so rest crawler uh, rdfa json ld so these are the things which help you to discover devices on the web then the layer 3 is the sharing component social networks api tokens jwt so this addresses sharing at the at the same time when you share things you have to share it securely so that is why the security aspects like authentication encryption uh these are also uh, part of this layer uh, on sharing then the final layer layer 4 is the composition now this is very important because uh, we talked about an example where you know my friend wanted to uh, cool his room where two devices were involved so for uh, achieving that particular goal he had to write some sort of a script and then integrate that script with uh, let's say a google assistant but, uh, but in the world of wot this layer enables you to compose different devices into a single application so it is very likely that an application will involve multiple devices in fact that is where the real value of iot is to be able to coordinate actions across multiple devices for a specific uh, environment or a context so this layer of composition enables you to do it you know mashups of of different devices system integrations node red where you know through a graphical uh, ui you can drag and drop modules and then connect those modules so that is what node red enables and then this if this then that you might have heard of this uh, service so that can also be integrated or utilized at this layer 4 which is the composition and uh, comp com composability layer of wot uh, model so this is uh, what it is and if you look at many of these things here something that uh, pops out to uh, normal uh, web developers right most of these terms will be familiar to web developers html json web sockets rest api json ld rest crawler api tokens ifttt right all these things will be familiar to uh, web developers and this is the real uh, benefit to web developers so in one video you can take a look at this video later in this video they make a very interesting statement very uh, i think it's a good statement to remember web developers can now become iot developers because they don't have to learn new skills so previously it was difficult for web developers to get into iot because interoperability was an issue they had to learn new stuff how to integrate uh, different uh, diversity of uh, iot devices and often they ended up developing custom proprietary code which worked only for specific use cases now with wot what web developers can do they can develop reusable iot building blocks and these building blocks can now be used across different verticals whether you are in a agricultural sector or you are developing an application for a smart factory or smart city or it may be for home automation it doesn't matter these iot building blocks are now agnostic of the vertical or use case and they can be reused across uh, different use cases and uh, the real benefit is developers web developers can use their familiar tools and technologies and develop for iot uh, applications any questions at this point so this is about the architecture of wot so what we can expect is an app which will handle all the electronic appliances together yeah, or so configurable yes configurable if somebody app. develops an app you can have an app uh, today you might be having multiple apps on your phone to control different devices but now we will have a single app just like you have a single web browser you will have a single app and from that app you should be able to control all the devices because so what is the language now? the language is just wot 
and the app will understand uh, the WOT uh, syntax and the semantics. So it will know exactly what is the capability of a device. So as on date, such an app doesn't exist. As on date, doesn't exist, but people are, I think uh, it will soon come out. It's a, only a matter of time. OK, soon meaning next year? Could be next year, yeah. OK, I will tell soon. you later at the end of the talk because there are some limitations to WOT. OK, thanks. It is not all rosy. <laughs> So now what is the interaction model of WOT? Very simply, there are only three things which uh, define the capability of a, of a device. So those three things are properties, actions and events. So properties, let's say you are a temperature sensor. Uh, the property of the sensor is uh, the sensor reading. What is the current temperature? That is the property of the uh, sensor uh, and it could have one more property. What is the unit? For example, is it uh, giving the reading in Fahrenheit or in, is it in Celsius? So that, that is what we mean by a property. Uh, things like configuration parameters. So just now I talked about uh, Fahrenheit versus Celsius. So that could be a configuration parameter. Instead of being hard coded, you could configure that. You could tell the sensor from now on, give me all readings in Fahrenheit or vice versa. Then the status, right? Uh, in some cases, you know, maybe the sensor is uh, offline for some reason. So that could be a st status. Or in the case of a door, for example, whether the door is open or closed, that's a status. In some cases, uh, the device could be exposing a computational result. So this is interesting. When we talk about the web of things, obviously it is composed of things, but this thing need not be a physical device. It could also be a virtual device. So what do I mean by uh, a virtual device? Uh, let's say you are getting, uh, let's say there is an IoT system in which uh, data is coming from three different devices. And this particular, and we need in this IoT system, we need to do some computation. That is run some formula based on data coming from three devices. So what we do in this particular case is to create a virtual device, which will take as inputs three different readings, uh, obviously from th and three different devices in my example, and then it will run this computation and return a result that result becomes a property of the virtual device. So the point I want to make is a thing that we, uh, when we talk about things, it need not be a physical device. It can also be a virtual device that we can create for our application. Then the second aspect is actions. So actions can be, I have given examples. If it's a coffee pot, you can tell the coffee pot, pot start brewing. If it's a light bulb, start dimming uh, dimming in uh, fading fade out or if it's a, let's say a motor pump you can stop or start the motor pump so different kinds of actions are possible depending on the kind of device you are talking about but remember that although these are all very diverse devices you know coffee pot light engine they are all very diverse devices or for the for a printer for example or an ac or a fridge they are all now exposing their capabilities through a standard data model, no longer proprietary. So the way they expose this through a JSON file or JSON LD format, and in that there will be a field for actions. And in that actions, they will clearly list what are the actions supported, what is the uh, URI for these actions, what are the parameters of each actions, so now by providing all these things in a standard format, it becomes interoperable. So now, you know, we talked about a single app being able to control different devices. That app only needs to understand these three things, properties, actions, and events, and it will know exactly how to work with these things. Then the third aspect of the interaction model is events. So door open, door close, or in the case of a temperature sensor, which is sending data every 30 seconds, that is streaming data. 
So every time you get a data, that's an event or specific events, let's say fire alarm. So these are all the three different uh, things, properties, actions, events. Now, apart from this, which characterize the interaction model, you also have links, which is expected because in the world of uh, web, everything is interlinked, right? So take any document, you have hyperlinks going from one document to a, some other document on the web. Same thing can happen in the world of uh, WOT, where devices can be interlinked. So we can have a composite device, which then interlinks to three different devices. So this component device acts something like a proxy. So a consumer will interact with this proxy, and then this proxy will get data from three different devices, uh, you know, uh, under the hood and then maybe run some computations on the data and re respond back to the consumer of that data. So uh, how is this possible? Because now you have links going from the proxy uh, thing to the real physical things or virtual things uh, behind it. So the idea of linking documents, which is actually an idea on the web, is now transported or adapted to the idea of linking uh, devices in the world of IoT. So that is one of the aspects of uh, IoT, that is uh, linking devices. The other aspect is uh, directory. So one of the ways to discover IoT is uh, uh, an IoT device can register with a uh, registry or what they call as a directory. And then any consumer will first query the directory. So you can think of a directory like a search engine. In the case of a search engine, you have crawlers going and crawling the web to find out documents. That is how you know search engines get to know that these documents exist. But in the case of uh, WOT, the situation is a little bit more proactive. When a device comes up, it can actually register with a directory. So anyone who wants to consume that data can then query the directory to figure out what are the devices out there. And then once they know the devices, then they can query the devices to know the capability of the devices. So this is how you know, uh, you know discovery works in the world of uh, WOT. So linking, discovery, properties, actions, events. So these are the main things uh, to know. Now, uh, all these things, uh, they are packaged together under what is known as a thing description. So that is one of the essential things about uh, WOT. And in fact, one of the recommendation talks only about this thing description. So when we talk about uh, exposing the capabilities uh, of every device, those devices expose their capabilities through this called thing description, TD. And I just spoke about directories. These directories cont contain nothing but thing descriptions. So uh, for that reason, people normally say TD directory, thing description directory, or sometimes shortened as TDD, right? So this uh, gives you the vocabulary, how to you know define the capabilities of every device out there. So it get it gives the vocabulary def definition interaction. For example, we already spoke about interaction, where the interaction model can be a property, action, or an event. Right? These are all part of the interaction model. So how do you actually specify these things uh, in JSON? So that is what is described by this uh, standard. So. Uh, the interesting thing is it is not just concept, right? This thing, uh, WOT or specifically thing description is not just a con concept. It is now something that is machine readable. That is really what we want towards automation and uh, towards uh, autonomous management of these devices. So now an app which can get hold of these things will understand immediately what the device is capable of, capable of, how it can be controlled, what kind of events that device sends, and how to make sense of those events. Because now all those things are exposed through a standard uh, data model. 
and that is what thing uh, description is all about right so i don't i don't want to go into the details of this but if you read this document you will find many familiar things links i already talked about links how devices link to one another then there are also forms just like on the web we have forms you know to submit data same thing happens here you can submit data to iot device basically to configure the device so many concepts from the web have been uh, adopted and adapted for wot so this makes it easy for web developers to get into iot development so i would urge you to you know read these documents there are three main standards to read one is the architecture document the second is the thing description third is the discovery is it discovery discovery or directory uh, discovery yes so these are the three uh, documents to read uh, so and then look at some of the implementations so already many people have implemented wot so the w3 uh, the consortium in fact maintains a list of resources and this includes tools implementation directories wot middleware so one of the projects is the eclipse thing web which is a node js implementation but there are other people who have implemented uh, in python java rust dart so these are the common ones but as far as i could make out this is the active project and uh, yeah seems to be more mature than the other ones for directories uh, one of the things is wot hive so that is something you can take a look at there may be others then another one is the web things which is offered by a company called grelian so this was initially developed at mozilla one of the initial promoters of wot but from mozilla uh, this became a independent commercial entity and that provides uh, two things one is the gateway so if you are developing a wot gateway you can simply take this software implementation and put it on your gateway of course it may be licensed right and the other thing is uh, the framework so this gives a set of uh, iot building blocks see remember we talked about how developers can use reuse build iot building blocks across different use cases so they need to develop these building blocks once and then they can start using it across uh, different use cases but even this development you can bypass because there there are others who have done it and this is an example web things is an example so you can just take this implementation this framework and start building your iot application so this is probably the shortest path towards building a iot uh, ecosystem or a iot solution based on wot that conforms to a wot standard then there is siemens uh, actually it's a subsidiary uh, now it's a subsidiary of siemens called evosoft so they also have a platform for wot then there are so many other platforms out there but uh, if i look at all these things i have not done deep research on this but this is the one that seems to be more mature because it's a commercial platform uh, that came out of siemens so yeah i i expect this is more mature than any of the other things listed here right one of the uh, some of you might have heard of the concept of digital twins a digital twin is nothing but a digital representation of a real world entity so to give you a use case for example a smart home a home or for that matter a home can be represented in the digital domain so every aspect of the home whether it's a thermostat door or uh, the condition of the ac or uh, any other aspect in the home can be modeled uh, in the digital world so this is what we call as a digital twin so wot is being leveraged to create digital twins so eclipse ditto with the wot integration then there is another framework called wo twins so these are two examples that are using wot for this specific use case that is uh, to create and manage digital twins 
So any questions at this point before I go to the limitations? OK, let's go to the limitations. So one of the limitation is WOT unfortunately is not the only protocol or standard out there trying to unify IoT at the application layer. There is another protocol called the Matter protocol. It was earlier known as Project Chip. And uh, you know, this is being promoted by the Connectivity Standards Alliance, which itself was formerly known as Zigbee Alliance. So Matter is based on uh, other mature protocols such as thread, IPv6 and dot dot. So dot dot, some of you may recall, it's a protocol which, which had similar intentions to WOT and MATIC. That is how do we unify things at the application layer so that different devices can talk to one another. So dot dot started off uh, on that note and it was promoted by the Zigbee Alliance. Now Zigbee Alliance itself has you know, kind of evolved to this connectivity standards alliance. And this is now promoting matter protocol, which has kind of absorbed the dot not into it, dot dot into it. So the only thing with the matter protocol is it is not web friendly like WOT. It doesn't adopt the web paradigm. When I, when I talk about web paradigm, I'm talking about the URIs, HTTP, JSON and so forth. Uh, but one of the advantages or what I observe with the matter protocol is that it appears to have better industry industry adoption or traction at the moment. So already devices are coming out out there which are supporting the matter protocol. And uh, you know earlier Ramanathan asked a question. 2024 will it be the year for WOT? Will we be seeing apps? You know that support WOT so that a single app can control different devices. So that is yet to be seen. But what seems more likely is that there could be an app which controls different devices through the matter protocol. That is also looking likely. So the jury is still out there. We don't know uh, which of these two protocols will actually take the lead in the coming uh, year. That is 2024. But one of the interesting things about WOT is because it's a standard web based standard. It has hooks for any any other protocol. So one of the things it can do is it can interface with matter devices as well. So that is the power of WOT. So you can develop a thing description which will describe the capability of matter devices. And through this thing description, an app that supports WOT can also control matter devices. So under this, so if I look at it like this, it looks more likely that there would be an app which is more closely aligned with the WOT, which can control different devices, whether it's matter device or it's Zigbee device or any other device. Right. So that way, in my opinion, WOT seems to be more kind of attractive. But uh, as of today, matter seems to have more adoption. That's my assessment because it comes from uh, players who are already having a lot of cloud in the IoT industry. Like Zigbee Alliance has been around for years, and that is the alliance which is now behind uh, matter. And because of this, many other players have, you know, latched on to this matter protocol. So Samsung, Siemens, I don't know about Siemens, Samsung and many other guys are developing their devices that conform to the matter protocol. So that is still yet to be seen, you know, what will happen. So this is what uh, I have today. In terms of code, just to give you a flavor, this is how a, a particular thing description will look like. So this is a JSON. Uh, document that describes a smart door. So it gives the context. The context is nothing but a name. In this case, it defined, it points to a namespace defined by 
uh, W3C and then uh, it gives ID, title, security and then we talked about properties. We talked about three things, properties, actions and events. So for a prop, uh, for a smart door, what are the properties? So one of the property is state and how do you access the state through this URL? Right. So now uh, see the, uh, you see through this syntax, an app need not understand the nitty gritties of each device. It, it needs to only understand type, form, href and so on. And uh, it can make sense of uh, what comes out of this. Then actions. What are the actions that are possible on a smart uh, door? So for a smart door, locking is one of the actions. Unlocking is another action. And for each of this, there is a form. That is a URI through which these actions can be performed. Now in this example, href is the only thing, but there are other examples where along with the href, you can also attach extra data. Because when you fill a form, you might need to fill certain aspects of the form. So here this form may be very simple because it's just locking and unlocking without extra parameters. But there could be other things, right? There may be a temperature sensor, for example, which will have some sensitivity parameter. So you might have a form which has not only a href, but additional data to configure sensitivity on a particular temperature sensor. So there could be actions, uh, uh, forms which have additional parameters. So an example is here under events. Look at this form. Here, the event is actually opening the door. That is somebody opened the door. And uh, for this, it actually specifies what is the protocol you want to use. And it tells exactly what protocol, long pole. So, you know, uh, some of you may already know what this means, but if you are not a web developer, just to give you a flavor of what it is, typically on the web, what is the interaction? It is a client server interaction, right? Client makes a request, server gives a response. But what if you want the server to uh, push changes to the client? Uh, autonomously. So for that on the web, they have different uh, ways of doing it. One of them is a long pole where once in a while the client will make a request to the server, but server will not respond immediately. It will hold on to the request until an event occurs and then it will respond. This is what they mean by long pole. The other way is server push. Then the third way is something called web sockets where servers can push data to the client without client making an explicit request or making request for every piece of data that or state change that happens. So those things are also handled as part of the uh, WOT uh, standardization. So you can specify the sub protocol through which this particular event of a door opening is conveyed to the consumer. So here they say, out of the different possibilities or different options, it says that long pole is what is supported by this particular smart door. So that is exactly what it's saying. And uh, you know the door open event is also coming out as a string. So it also says what kind of data format will be is supported in this particular thing. So this is just to give you a flavor how a thing description looks like and how different devices, be it devices or gateways or in the cloud or uh, proxy devices or your mobile apps. So all this can now understand, can un I mean, they need to understand only a single format and this is what it is. So this is all I had to share any questions at this point. So I hope you found the session useful. Any questions?
Yeah, Ramanathan, go ahead. Sorry, that was by mistake. Yeah, I <laughs> okay, have no questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, quick thing, you spoke about two protocols, right? Yeah. You mean uh, matter protocol? Yeah, matter and uh, dot dot and other stuff. So yeah, dot dot is an older be... one. I don't okay. think uh, it will have a future because Zigbee Alliance itself is now promoting matter. So and okay. many of the things in dot dot have been adopted by matter. Okay. So, so matter future... versus uh, WOT. That is what I see today. Okay. Uh, that can be both the protocols simultaneously existing, right? Or uh, that also needs to be standardized. No, if both exist, then again the market is fragmented. Okay. What will okay. happen so, now? Your uh, your app has to implement two things. Hmm. Okay. Which means uh, standardization is needed at that level also. So one of them will have to give in to the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it both are standardized. It's just that how will the adoption go? If more okay. people adopt uh, WOT, then that will become success. Matter will fall off the rails. If okay. more people adopt matter, then uh, you know people will forget WOT. Everyone will see it's all uh, numbers game. Say once, it's 50, once 50. people see that everyone is gravitating towards a specific standard, then uh, you know because of the network effects, everyone will start moving towards that. Okay. If it's 50 50, the market is still fragmented. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have heard the good things about my matter. In fact, while I was researching on WOT, that is when uh, I came across more details about matter and I got to know a little bit more about that. Uh, so, yeah, see. Uh, I'll show you this one by Birch to so this article. So this is uh, fairly recent, January 2023. This was published. So how it integrates with Alexa, Apple Home, Google Home, Samsung Smart Things. So different devices now starting to support Matter. And all these are big names. Good. Oh, what okay. do you think is the adoption in India? Do you so see? So now, uh, no, just to complete that, today what happens? You uh, to support a new device, somebody has to develop uh, something called the Alexa Actions, and similarly, they would have to develop on the Samsung ecosystem something to control those devices, and so on. Now what will happen? You just need to implement the uh, matter protocol and now suddenly that device becomes accessible through a entire stretch of uh, ecosystems. Yeah, coming back to your question, what was the question? Got it. OK, uh, just my question was around adoption uh, in India. IoT for home automation is not uh, taken off yet. So you see uh, adoption uh, that easy? No, India is difficult market. First, it is cost sensitive. People don't adopt mm -hmm. things that easily. OK, but you uh, see it in the West. Yeah, but uh, in industrial IoT, there is a definite uh, opportunity. A scope. OK, yeah. industrial IoT, there is scope. But yeah, yeah, home automation will be difficult. Yeah. OK, thanks. Nice. But it all depends on the Indian middle class. If they are more uh, tech savvy, they are more willing to shell out uh, rupees, then it's a different game. Yep, e expected. Uh, those people who are more cost conscious, they will see, OK, why do I need to spend so much when my traditional switch is more than enough? Yeah. Right, think, like my yeah. friend who has invested in a what do you call it? I don't know blinds, which blinds, and then the AC, which can be controlled through his uh, Google Home. Okay. India discretionary income is expected to go up, so probably mm -hmm. adoption. Okay, thanks. And you nice might one. have noticed uh, many of the devices in the market 
nowadays they come and they they are advertised as supporting alexa supporting google home etc hmm i have right. to check that i did not buy anything new of late i'll check on yeah. that so these kind of things are also happening and uh, now uh, so if i buy let's say uh, ac which supports google home i will not be able but instead i have a let's say amazon echo device then i cannot control it so what i need is a google home for that so that particular feature of that ac is a waste to me because i don't have a, a, the google uh, ecosystem in my home instead i have invested in the amazon echo but unfortunately uh, that particular ac doesn't have integration with amazon echo so this is what we mean by the current fragmentation of the iot market but in future devices will come saying that supports the matter protocol now if you have an app which has the matter protocol through that app you can control it for that matter even those alexa google home all of them can be on the matter protocol right i can have both alexa and google home yeah yeah you can at do my that. home yes yes, yes. Uh, without device or with without device. device also i i guess yeah because see instead of going through uh, see the echo device is just what listening to you taking your voice commands you can give those commands through your phone as well yeah Okay, a lot of uh, exciting stuff. See, some time back I was uh, in Chroma looking at different ACs. I did not buy anything, but I was looking at different ACs. I, as I remember, uh, some of the ACs had this thing can be controlled through Amazon Alexa or something like that. I remember vaguely. so that is why i made that comment that nowadays devices are coming with that sticker that i can be controlled through these voice based uh, interfaces nice so yeah uh, bottom line is this to conclude whether it's a wot or whether it's matter it doesn't matter to us as consumers it matters to the industry as a whole of course but what will happen is that if one of these succeed then suddenly we will see iot taking off in a big way so suddenly uh, you know interaction with devices beca will become very easy without worrying about uh, these interoperability issues yep so others yes. any questions one more example i will give because this is an interesting example from the automotive perspective see today more and more electric cars electric vehicles are on the road but uh, it's a complete vertical which is isolated from uh, the world uh, the web world right it's it's a tightly integrated vertical so a electric scooter for example it has to be charged through a uh, let's say electrical point at a gas station or some some other facility and you would have to know which are the nearest points how much mileage you still have with the current battery capacity or battery uh, utilization so all these parameters can now be exposed easily through this wot standard so what what are the things that can be exposed an electric scooter will have its own description okay then the battery will have its own wot thing description then the electric charging station will have its description so all these three di different descriptions now they can be integrated easily through an app and it doesn't matter uh, you know what kind of electric vehicle you have what battery you have what kind of charging station is out there you can mix and match as long as they all expose their capabilities through their own thing descriptions and the app 
can understand all these things. So oh. that that is what you know. This uh, th that's what makes this whole thing very exciting because now this headache of integrating different things is gone because that problem is solved at a design level through standardization. So how is security handled here that I uh, control that is, my device? That is another limitation. That is, okay, I, hmm. that is still an unsolved problem. People always worry about security and that is still a justifiable thing. So see, there are three ways in which devices can connect to the web. One way is direct connection. Directly they connect. Second is they connect to, through a gateway. Third is they connect in any way they want, but everything the WOT exposure happens through the cloud. So these are the three ways. So when it comes to security, the first method is the least secure, where a device is directly connecting to the cloud. Hmm. Little bit more secure is where device connects through a gateway. Most secure is device connects through some proprietary mechanism, which is not like published or well known to people, then uh, the WOT thing description is exposed through the cloud. So different ways in which deployments can happen, each has its own security uh, yeah, footprint. But generally, yeah, uh, what I have read is that security is still a concern because the standard, uh, the people who do the standardization, they themselves, in my view, they themselves are not security experts. And typically the hackers are smarter today than the security experts. They will somehow or other find a loophole. So security hmm. is still a concern, yes. But okay. that is uh, even with or without WOT or any kind of standardization, that, and that concern is still there. Mm. Yeah, so I would say that uh, WOT or matter has not solved it or not made it worse. That concern was always there and it is still there. Okay.